In our last few episodes, I've had the privilege of interviewing a few clients of mine from CRE Success. So I thought maybe it was time to flip the script and to invite one of my clients to interview me. Well, that's not quite how it happened. He invited me to come onto his podcast and then I humbly requested if I could use the interview to share with you on this podcast. So that's what we're going to be doing in today's episode. Hello and welcome to episode 183 of Commercial Real Estate Leadership. I'm your host, Darren Prokoviak, and if you've got a commercial real estate business and you want it to grow faster, then I can help. Find me on LinkedIn and send me a DM with the word grow. If you send me the word grow, I'll know what you're looking for. So find me on LinkedIn. There are links in the show notes for you to do that. You can also find CRE Success on Instagram, We are at CRE Success, all one word. Again, send me a DM with the word grow and we can have a conversation about what it is that we can do to help you get your business growing. And it's a new financial year here in Australia. The financial year in Australia starts on the 1st of July. So it's a fantastic time for you to be setting some new goals, casting forward a new vision and executing on a plan that is going to get your business growing into this new financial year and growing sustainably beyond that as well. In today's episode, Will Tong is kind of our special guest. He's actually interviewing me. This is a clip from the WTF podcast. If you're wondering what the, no, that's Will Tong and Friends, WTF, right? WTF podcast, Will Tong and Friends. So that's the name of the podcast and Will got me up to Sydney. I'm based in Melbourne to be interviewed on video. So we'll be releasing the video of this episode as well. And I tell you what, he spoke to me for about an hour and 20 minutes, which is so much longer than we typically would do for an episode on this show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up the interview into two parts. So we'll do part one today and we'll do part two in our next episode. So for now, I'll pass over to Will. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of WTF Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Today, we have one of Australia's top commercial real estate agency coaches, Darren Krakowiak. Welcome to the show. Will, great to see you. Lovely to, lovely to see you. Great, uh, great to have you here. I know you just flew off from Melbourne. I did this morning, yeah. Yeah, how's your flight? The flight was good. I yep. was sitting next to this guy. I'm going to the footy tonight to see Carlton play the Swans. And he was going as well. And I noticed that he was, but I didn't want to start a conversation with him because otherwise I might be stuck talking about footy for the whole flight. But I did have a peek on his phone because he was an older guy with big text. Uh-huh. And he was complaining about body odor to somebody he was texting. So I don't know if he was complaining about me or not, but if I have a smell, I apologize. Oh, no, that, that's okay. I can't smell any. I don't think the audience can smell it either, so it's all good. It's not smell a vision. It's, it's not, no, it's not. <laughs> yes, we, we don't have that technology just yet. Good. <laughs> well, look, I'm, I'm glad you had a good flight and thanks for coming um, over, over, uh, over here to, uh, to this podcast studio. I've got a lot of questions I want to ask you because um, I think, you know, given your background and given what you're doing right now, it's going to add a lot of value to my audience and to me especially as well. And so what I want to do is maybe just go back down memory lane a little bit and I want to see what Darren is like growing up before he got into property, before he became, you know, one of his best best you know coaches in, in, in Australia. Like what were you doing as you were growing up? You grew up in, in, in Melbourne, I, I I did, yeah. I was born in Melbourne. So I guess I was never a sporty kid. I was always more interested in things like radio. So radio was something that I did, community radio and a little bit of commercial radio growing up, high school and university. You know, I was someone who probably gravitated towards leadership. So, you know, I'd always run for form captain. I'd usually be form captain and I'd always be on the SRC. I was on the debate team. So I was one of those kids, like, so a little bit dorky, but still, I guess, maybe friends with some of the right people. So not a complete complete dork, but yeah, that was that was me growing up and never really thought about commercial real estate or real estate at all. But one thing I did have, I guess, was the gift of the gab. So as a, a person with, I guess, extroversion and a lack of my own voice, probably uh, a career in real estate or in sales or something in that ilk was, was probably in the cards. So at what age did you realize you had that gift of the gab? You know, I can remember in primary school, one of my nicknames was Luna Park. 
Luna Park. Because I have a big mouth, right? <laughs> so people out of Sydney and Melbourne might not know, but Luna Park is an amusement park where the entrance is a massive mouth. Mm. And, you know, teachers, some of the teachers kind of got me and they know how to, I guess, um, motivate me and channel that energy. But some of them would give me very low marks for behaviour. I was always academically good, mm. but I think I was probably a challenge for some teachers because I had a, a lot of energy. I was one of those people who would question things. You know, back in that day, even in public schools, they would have religious education and, you know, I'd be asking difficult questions, which uh, eventually led to me being uh, put with all the other kids who didn't come from Anglo-Christian homes to because I was difficult in that class. So I guess I was maybe someone who questioned things a little bit. And yeah, I think leadership was always something that I was interested in as well that sort of carried through into my career. Yeah, excellent. And so you, you studied primary school, high school in Melbourne, and what was the path to property? Was property always the thing you wanted to do? Not at all. So I did a Bachelor of Economics and a Bachelor of Commerce double degree at Monash in Melbourne. Okay. And the first job that I got out of university happened to be for a property economics firm that was the firm that is now known as Urbis. So back then it was a company called Jeb Holland Damasi, which was lately, which was later emerged with Urbis, become Urbis JHD. And then I think they've dropped the JHD now. Mm -hmm. And that was a company that specialised in providing shopping centre owners and large format retailers with uh, consulting reports on their turnover, forecasting, you know, if you renovate this centre, if you refurbish this location, this is the sort of uplift in revenue you can expect based on the mapping of the trade area and the amount of spending in that trade area and the market shares and stuff like that. So that is kind of where property came in, but it was more from a, I guess, an economic kind of lens. And after that, I worked for a company called M3 Property, which back then was only really in Melbourne, but now it's a national valuations firm mm. for commercial. And I was in research there. And then I got the opportunity to work for JLL. And a lot of your audience would know Nerida Connersby. And when Nerida went off to have her second baby, I was the maternity leave replacement for her right. to come in and run research in Victoria at JLL at that time. And um, I, I remember thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to go and work for an agency. I mean, that's not very, you know, maybe I was a bit uppity and a bit of a snob, <laughs> but I thought, you know, like real estate agents, like, I don't know if I should be doing that. But I did really like the international opportunities that JLL um, offered. I was around 25 at the time, and mm. I think I was interested in opportunities to work overseas, and JLL was certainly an avenue to fill that that endeavor. So I took on that opportunity, and to give JLL full credit, within two years, they gave me the opportunity then to go and work in South Korea. Great, great. I spent about four years working at JLL as well, and great company, one of the best companies I've ever worked for. And I must say, out of all the research uh, hubs, property research hubs available in Australia, JLL is probably number one. Um, that that would be true. I, you know, they sell their research as well and they invest very heavily in it. And yeah, I can remember thinking it was a very important thing that we were all doing in research <laughs> at the time. I had, and I think, you know, related to my, I guess, passion for leadership, I was managing the team of what was called strategic researchers. So the people that were conduits into the business, I was managing that national team as well mm -hmm. as running the Victorian research team. And yeah, like I thought it was really important. And I like the fact that JLL invested in it. And that was actually the role that I took when I went into Korea as well. I was doing um, research and also some consulting work. Yeah. So, so JLL is across many multiple countries across the world. So why did you choose South Korea? Didn't really choose it. So the first role that they offered me was something in Hong Kong. Um, and I didn't take that because I didn't like the role it was to be like the head of industrial research for Asia. I thought, oh, that sounds a bit Maybe, maybe that would be a lot more exciting now, but back then industrial wasn't really a very sexy asset class. Mm. It was probably the ugly duckling of the office retail at Industrial 3. Yeah. So I didn't take that and then Korea came up and it was around May when it came up and they said, why don't you go over there and have a look? So they flew me over there and, you know, this was 2007, pre-GFC when, you know, people really gave the corporate credit card a hard working and they showed me a good time. And I yep. thought, I can live here. And May is actually a beautiful time of the year to be in Korea in terms of the weather. It's perfect. Yeah. So I, I took up that opportunity and, you know, I, I thought probably it was a stepping stone to somewhere else, like within Asia, I guess, but ended up staying there for 11 years and, you know, from that role then moved into a JLL tenant rep. So when the GFC happened, a lot more expensive people were let go. And I was, I guess, a relatively cheap resource for them to keep in the in the country at the time. So they said, why don't, and I was sort of doing a little bit of help with tenant rep, like when people from overseas would come, I would help out with like doing the tours of the market and stuff like that. They said, well, why don't you just do that? So I did. And, you know, eventually it was a good time to cut your teeth in 
transactions because there wasn't a lot of transactions happening. So the company had very low expectations in 2009 of sort of the amount of runs on the board that you could get. Yep. But what, one good thing that JLL did have was a good network of regional clients. So there were these opportunities to actually just do some transactions. And that was sort of how I built up a bit of track record and then built from there. Yeah, great. And how's your Korean? Not very good. I can read Korean, so oh, you can. Oh. but it's all phonetic, right? So yes. there's Hangul is a phonetic, a phonetic, you know, writing system. Yeah. So I can I can read it, and I have basic sort of vocabulary. But my grammar is not very good. I've tried to learn it a few times. I never that that wasn't the reason why I was in Korea. You know, when I worked at JLL and later at CBRE, I was not there to speak Korean. I was there to help with. I guess, multinational companies and you know, also help with, with building the business. Yeah, no, that, that's fascinating because I've never worked overseas. So I don't have the perspective of what it would be like in a foreign country that, you know, with a language that I, that's not you know, native to me. So I, I'd imagine to be successful, I mean, obviously you ultimately became the managing director uh, you know, of South Korea. So I'd imagine there'll be instances where your Korean skills were tested, right? I think my people skills were tested, not so much my Korean <laughs> skills. So yeah, what happened was I was at JLL for a few years running office leasing and tenant rep, mm. and then CBRE approached me to become the country head of their business. And I think the lesson is that outside of Australia, I was given opportunities that I would not have been given if I was in Australia. And that's not to say that I didn't deserve them or I didn't work hard for them, but I think that you know, taking on that, being willing to take on that responsibility and also being willing to, I guess, get out of your comfort zone. And by that point at CBRE, well, by the time I joined CBRE, I'd been in Korea for eight years. Mm. And one of the, I think, needs of the CBRE Korea business at the time was for it to be more, I guess, attached to the global and the regional platform. It was sort of like running at its own little island. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the things that they wanted me to do was to really get the, I guess, the CBRE way incorporated into the, the local career business. Right, that, that almost never works. So it, I think it did work. Yeah. Like if I look at you know, what was achieved at the time I was there in terms yeah. of the, the growth of the business and sort of where it is now, I think it all starts with leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And previously, there was not so much, I guess, connection between the global platform and the regional platform and the local market. Because I think there was, I think the way I should put it was that, you know, we're a global company that does business in Korea. We're not a company in Korea that happens to be global. I can't remember, I had a, a phrase that I put around to try and get people thinking a little bit more about the help and the opportunities that could come from connecting with the global platform. And I think partly it's also cosmetic, right? Because them putting me in that position, someone who didn't speak Korean, someone who wasn't Korean, someone who at the time was 35 years old, that was in itself, what I represented was change. Mm -hmm. Because previously there was a Korean gentleman who was actually Korean American actually, but he was more Korean in his approach. So me in that seat symbolized change mm -hmm. and then change sort of came from that. And back to your question in terms of speaking Korean, I, I didn't really speak Korean, but it was, I think in Korea, and you know, you might know from some other cultures in Asia, it's very hierarchical and it's really yes. important how old yeah. you are and, yes. and all of that sort of stuff. And you know, I was seen as too young and I think that was a, a challenge for me for the first sort of six to 12 months was to be not trying to prove myself or prove anyone wrong, but just to establish myself in that position and to show that I was actually capable of the responsibility that the company had entrusted me with. Mm. So how long were you there for? For, three, as, as CBRE, for three, three years. years. Yeah. So what changes did you see in the, in the business landscape? So I probably, I tried to break down some of the Korean ways of doing business while still being respectful of the fact that we are in Korea, right? So if I can think of some examples without disparaging anyone, you know, some of the older staff would be quite hard on the younger staff mm -hmm. because I guess and some of this is tied up in the fact they have mandatory or compulsory military service and that's sort of the way things run. But, you know, I was trying to get people to be a little bit more, I guess, even in their approach mm -hmm. or less heavy handed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that involved sometimes leading by example, but also it meant having to direct people to change their behaviour at time. Um, so that was that was a change that was happening inside, I guess, the business that I was in, but more broadly outside of the Korea business that I was in was just, uh, you know, the increasing amount of foreign capital that was coming into the market, which actually made the 
the approach a little bit more global. So I think it was a good time for me to be making those changes because actually that equipped the business to be better able to work more cooperatively with all the foreign capital that was flowing in, but also foreign capital that was flowing out because you know huge growth of Korean pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and so forth meant that there was this huge opportunity that perhaps was going untapped and maybe some of our competitors at the time were doing a better job of actually taking advantage of, whereas I think by the time I left, and certainly in terms of where it is now, I think it's you know it's it's way way ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 fascinating. So after you, <clears throat> excuse me, so after you left CBRE, what, what were your next steps? I came back to Australia. So I got okay. married, and I came back to Australia with JLL. So I was working in the Melbourne team in tenant representation, and I guess that was where I started to have a little bit of a, a pivot. So I came back to Melbourne and... And what year was this? This was 2019. Okay. So I came back and one thing I noticed that was going on was um, I had always been, well, not always, but probably for the previous eight or nine years, I'd been trying to help, help myself be better through, you know, personal and professional development. And I came back to Melbourne and I thought that, I thought that maybe we'd be further ahead in that in Australia than we were in Korea because, like, it's a bigger platform and, you know, it's just more of a... I don't know, a modern market or, or whatever. But what I saw was that there were people in the residential market, your Josh Vegans, your Tom Panosses, and you know everyone else in between, in yep. terms of those, if you like, extremes, that were providing this leadership, this support, this coaching for the co- residential real estate sector, and that there was no one that I could see that was doing it for the commercial real estate industry. So mm-hmm. I saw that as a real, one, gap in the market, two, an opportunity to lead, but in a different way. And as it happened in uh, early 2020, COVID rolled around. And, uh, you know, just before that, I got made redundant anyway. So I had a very clear idea in my mind about what I wanted to do next. I'd Mm. done things like design the logo and acquired the domain name of CRE Success. So I'd done a lot of thinking. So I was ready to go. The only problem was, of course, that COVID had just started. So it wasn't a really great time to start a business. But at the same time, I think it probably was a good time because it meant that I could be a little bit more patient in terms of the... Because it takes time when you're starting a new business, particularly one that I think isn't really proven in terms of, like, you know, is there a market for this? So... Mm. It just meant that maybe I gave myself a little bit more grace in terms of uh, the amount of growth that I was willing to accept or that I was hoping for in that in those early stages. Yeah. So when you were first starting off <clears throat> the coaching business, what were some of the key values and, and, and messages you were trying to give, give across to, to your clients? Yes, I remember one of the first things I did was I wrote this little ebook, uh, mini ebook called The Five P's of Commercial Real Estate Success. And I thought that I would share this as a sort of a way to sort of communicate who I am and a bit about values. So the five P's were passion, persistence, positive thinking, preparation, and professionalism. So those were the five sort of characteristics which I felt were really important in order to be successful in this industry. Mm. And probably passion was the one that didn't come obvious to me earlier, but the other four when, you know, I can remember at one point, at some stage when I was at CBRE, one of the, the we used to have these forums where, you know, the, the CEO would come in and the staff would ask a few questions. And one of the questions that's, I think, I think someone, maybe I asked, maybe I asked it once at JLL and then someone else asked it at CBRE, is like, what would you recommend that we focus on to be successful? And, you know, the CEOs had their answer. And I thought, well, what would someone ask me? And I came up with my answers and then, so I was ready to go with those answers, but then I thought passion's the other one because you've got to have maybe not a passion for the industry. I don't know if you necessarily need that, but you need to be passionate about something that you can apply in the industry so you've got that sort of internal motivation to you know, continue to improve and to, I guess, the point of writing a book like that is, or it's not a book, it's a mini ebook, mm-hmm. is to sort of point out, like, you know, where is that that drive and, and that, that determination going to come from? So can you elaborate on that? Because we hear passion thrown around a lot, especially in social media these days, but I, I, I personally don't have a... F- great grapple on what it should mean. I've got my own, obviously, interpretation and perceptions, but in, in your view, you know, why, what is passion and why is it so important and why is it, why do you have it, you know, as one of your core values? So I think it just provides a bit of purpose to what you're doing. So, like, when I'm talking about certain aspects of commercial real estate, if there's no, I guess, Sort of, you know, you sort of know nothing, nothing behind it. It's kind of hollow. Uh-huh. So I think the importance of passion is to make sure that we're not just empty vessels, or we're not too academic, or we're not 
to transactional, but actually where you know we might be visionary or we might be soulful or we might be, you know, it's, it's just that anchor of, of realness. And again, it, it could come because you know, a lot of people who work in real estate have been like their parents or someone they, they, you know, they respected or admired worked in real estate or you know, for others, it, it might just be, I, I don't know, right? But for me, I never really knew why I was there. Mm. So, I wasn't, so for me, it was never an answer that naturally came. But then I kind of thought, well, actually, that my passion is the leadership side of things. And like, you know, so you asked me what I was like when I was a kid and I only realized that very much later. I always was putting my hand up for leadership responsibility. And so I guess that's sort of where the passion was. And that's why I think, you know, in the roles that I had in real estate, it was it was more about the leadership side and helping others to become better and to you know, achieve something and to achieve something for the business. I think that's what sort of lit me up. And uh, I, I can't exactly remember the context of the question about why passion, but I think it's like, you've got to have something there. Otherwise you're just sort of working for a paycheck, right? Yeah. And um, there's no real motivation to sort of Keep going. Yeah, and and do you see passion in, in commercial real estate professionals? I mean, I'm, I'm asking from from perspective because I've you know I've been doing real estate basically all my adult, adult life, and I remember when I was younger, early in my career, I was very doubtful that I was in the right career. Like I I I, I was kind of good at real estate, but I, I felt like maybe I wasn't really in the right profession. So I had a lot of doubt and, and I think that was, that reflected my performance. I think it was later on when I was probably, when I was uh, about almost 30, where I then realized, actually, I actually like real estate. Mm. Um, probably not for the reasons that I thought I liked it for when I was younger. So I think when I was younger, I, I thought, you know, real estate is just a nice way of making above average money for in my mind, you know, lower effort. Because I look at all my friends who just graduated university, they're, they're working as lawyers and accountants and they're working, you know, 50 hours, 60 hours. And, and I'm a real estate agent, I'm working like 35, 40 hours and I'm making probably more than them. Right. So for me as a young guy back then, I was like, oh, this is just a pretty pretty good way to make more money. But I didn't really, really enjoyed it until I think I was a little bit older. Yeah. And I felt like, actually, I really like real estate because it's actually more to just making money. Um, uh, you, you, I'm a more, more of a problem solver yep. for my clients and I think and that's how I think I found my passion in real estate. So I think a lot of people, um, before they find their passion they then just make some money or because they do it because it's easier than doing something else, something else because it comes easy to them. So yeah, the, the money is often a motivator but we've got to get beyond what the money is to find out well why does that matter, right? Um, like what is it that the money is going to get you? It could be significance, right? We just want to be seen as successful. That is actually other motivator as opposed to the money itself. It could be to provide for a future that you want for your family or it could be to, you know, to without getting too psychological, it could be to prove your daddy wrong or whatever, whatever it is that you're, uh, you know, you're looking for. And I think the reason why the passion is important is because uh, yeah, perhaps as you might have figured out is like if you're going to continue and stay in this industry, if you don't have any passion, then there's like, it's just burnout, right? Because mm. passion, I would say perseverance without passion isn't grit, it's just a grind, right? Yes. So if we can find a sort of reason to be and have that passion within us, then it gets easier to do the things that help us be successful in that industry. So I think, yeah, lack of uh, passion will get you some way, but it doesn't really, it can lead to dangerous paths, I think, in terms of you know, distraction, substance abuse, you know, the, the wrong types of motivators or just burnout. And, you know, I think that's why some people don't last in the industry even yeah. after they come in with a, with a bang. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so on that note, I'm, I'm curious to, to understand, obviously you're coaching a lot of high performers in the industry. What are some of the top problems real estate ag- commercial real estate agents have? Yeah. And second question is, what are the top problems commercial real estate agency owners have. Yeah, so uh, most of my private coaching clients are commercial real estate principals, the business Mm -hmm. owners, but I'll I'll talk a bit about the agents as well because I have a a digital course for them and that was sort of what I was doing earlier in my business. Uh There's sort of three main things that is the problem for them. Either they don't have enough leads, they're not converting the leads at the, you know, the optimum rate, or they don't know how to accelerate their production through, you know, things like processes or having the right team 
or you know, using the right systems, if you mm-hmm. like. So mm-hmm. uh, it's generally those three things. And yeah, that, that's what I would say for the agents as the three problems. And there's you know, obviously solutions to those problems in terms of you know, lead generation, inbound, outbound referrals, in terms of improving your conversion rate. It's around you know, working with more of the right clients so they continue to work with you. It's about increasing your win rate in itself. And then with business owners, probably the three main challenges around people so it's not being able to find the right people and Mm -hmm. we can go into sort of why that is and what the differences are between bigger firms and smaller firms and so forth so it's people it's clients so often i think in we're focusing on all the clients rather than specializing or saying these are the types of clients that will serve and we hang on to bad clients because we've worked hard to get them and we don't actually then make the room for the ideal clients that we're best placed to serve. Mm. So we've got to focus on the right clients in, in, when we're running a business. And finally, uh, we've got to let go of certain things as a business owner. This is also relevant for, for, for commercial real estate agents, staying within your zone of genius, the stuff mm-hmm. you're good at, the stuff mm-hmm. you get paid for and the stuff you enjoy. But then we need a business that works so you're not overworked. So we need certain systems in place. Uh, we need... Um, a plan, right? We need a financial plan. We need some strategic priorities to actually provide some direction and focus for the business. Mm-hmm. So they're th- the main sort of things. And I think, you know, it's it's about leadership for agents. It can be around having the right person who can either be a good role model and is capable of showing them the right way. And in terms of the leaders in commercial real estate businesses, it's about being the right leader so that you can provide that leadership that others can then, I guess, move in alignment with the vision that you're trying to create. I have, I have a question about the ideal client that, that you've raised. So I know commercial real estate is extremely competitive and it's extremely territorial as well. And a lot of times we try to win listings for the sake of preventing your competition getting the listing. So it's more of a defense sort of mechanism rather than a sort of, you know, actually I want to sell this property. And I, in my experience anyway, a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm, I strategically try to chase a listing because I don't want CBRE or Collier to get it. But I find myself wasting so much time, energy, effort, servicing that particular client that's not an ideal client, quote unquote, but I have to do it anyway. So what, what do you say about that? You gotta change your beliefs. <laughs> okay, so walk, 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 walk me through that because okay. uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm just looking back at, at what I've done in the past when I was working in an agency, mm. you kind of go, well, I, I, want, I want to make money. That's, you know, I want to hit my target. That's very important, but I also don't want that guy. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that you said. One is, yeah. you know, schadenfreude, right? You know what schadenfreude is, mm. which is the mm. German word for having, getting pleasure out of someone else's misfortune, which is kind of like the reason why you might like somebody to not win that work just because you don't want them to win. But... In a world which is abundant, there is plenty of opportunities for all of us. So I would be encouraging people who are thinking like that to, and you gave the answer, you said it's much harder for you to win that work, it's more difficult, it's more it's more headaches once you get the work, so don't, don't worry about it, let them have it. Because the busier that they are doing that type of work, the less time that they have to be chasing the clients that you wanna work with. But even then I would say we live in a world of abundance so we don't need to worry about that anyway because there's plenty of clients to go around. now. I know that's easier said than done when we're trying to build our pipeline and reach our targets and hit our financial goals, but it is a a mindset thing and it's probably uh, something that has taken me a while to learn, but I wouldn't worry too much about the competition and in terms of their results. I think it's about your own improvement. The only only benefit of comparison is that it's gonna make you, or there's no benefit really, because it just makes you vain or it makes you angry. So don't worry about what others are doing, just focus on what it is that you wanna do. Be really clear about the clients that you want to serve and you know, make sure that you're best placed to be able to win that work. I don't know yeah. if I've answered your question though because... I, I, mean, I mean, you certainly have, but I'm, I'm also, I want to push back a little bit on that because yeah. I think in, in a market that we had in 2022, it was, a, it was a great market, lots of transactions and, you know, commercial probably were selling left, right and centre. And so a lot of agency owners thrived during that period. Yep. Um, and it come to around 23, um, speaking to some of my industry colleagues, and I'm, I'm sure you have as well, um, transaction volume is almost like half yep. compared to the previous year. You still got payroll, you still got rent, you've still got all these overheads you need to pay. And the, the, the pie, I guess, figuratively speaking, like it's shrunk, right? So how, how do you then kind of def- defend what you're saying about, or don't worry about those, those listings, 
just focus on the ideal clients where there's probably not as many opportunities to choose from in a sort of downward market. I think one of the reasons why people don't like to specialise is because of the fear of missing out, right? Mm -hmm. They feel like if I'm fishing in a bigger pond, then I've got more opportunities. But your conversion rate will be so much higher if you are focused very much on the ones that you are more likely to be able to be the ideal partner service provider for. Mm. So while I understand that we might be tempted when the markets aren't you know, as abundant as we would like to start to go outside of our specialty. That only gets us further away from what it is that we're actually um, there to do. And I think that actually dilutes our ability to win um, more of the right clients because then we don't stand for anything. Like, you know, what is it that this person does? Oh, he does a bit of that, does a bit of this. Like, in terms of a business owner, you've got to have your business set up to be able to write out those periods. So a lot of clients talk about the importance of having a property management business mm -hmm. that has recurring revenue to be able to support the business even when transactions get to zero, mm -hmm. right? So I guess, again, I'm not directly answering your question, but I'm sort of saying, if, mm -hmm. you're, if, if you're coming to me as a business owner with that problem, then I guess my answer to you is grow your property management portfolio mm -hmm. because that is the thing that's gonna keep the lights on. And if you wanna go and chase other clients, you can, but there's going to be a lower rate at which you're going to win those clients because that's not your natural, I guess, strength. Mm. And it's going to take you away from your ability to be able to serve more of those right clients. Mm. But it's it's a balance, right? Like I, I get like people are tempted to do that, but it only gets you further away, I think, you know, from being able to be, you know, the known, liked and trusted specialty expert in that niche, in that territory in which you are operating. Mm. Mm. No, that's that's great feedback. Yeah, I, I want to ask about also importance of branding because obviously you know we're talking about niche niches and you know, your zonal genius and and, and being a specialist. How important is it? I suppose a personal brand in the industry and the company brand. And when I say company brand, I'm, I also want to elaborate. I'm also talking about the big companies, the JLLs and CBREs versus the boutique companies that we're seeing pop up everywhere now. Um, so maybe, you know, what are your views on the importance of personal brand in this industry and also the company brand? So I, I think that, I think the personal brand is more important than the company brand. Uh -huh. So if, if I was coaching an individual, I'd be saying to them to really invest hard in their personal brand because that's something that it can't be copied, it can't be taken away from them. It belongs to you, right? The brand of your company doesn't belong to you. The company could, if you say, I, you know, I live and breathe company X and then company X becomes company Y because of a takeover, then you, you, you've lost your branding or you've, you know, you're not who you said you were, mm. whereas you're always, you, per, you, you know, you're always yourself. So I, I think when, and, and, and that's proven through when high performing agents then walk across the street, usually most of their business comes with them mm -hmm. because people are interested in doing business with the person, not really doing business with the brand. Now, I think if you're a middling agent, if you're someone who perhaps, you know, doesn't want to work that hard, or maybe you don't have all of the natural ability, certainly the brand that you work for can give you a little bit of support, but I would be more focused on my personal brand as an individual than I would be on the company brand. Mm. But at the same time, I think, you know, as a business owner, if, if, you're, if you own a boutique business, the brand is really important because it's one of the differentiators that you have because people, high performing agents are generally more attracted to working for the bigger firms just mm. because there's a bit more gravitas with that. Um, so if you want to have the ability to attract good people and even not high performing agents, but just quality people, then the branding is important, It's also, but also your personal branding is, right? Mm -hmm. Because who you are as a leader, the culture within the office, that's all gonna be relevant in terms of your ability to be able to attract the right people and the right clients to the firm. Yeah, so that goes back to solving one of the initial, pro one of the problems that agency owners have, which is hiring good talent and retaining good talent. So having that good personal brand and company brand can also assist with attracting good talent and retaining them. Yeah, I, I kind of, uh, ask my um, clients to focus on three things when it comes to um, attracting people. So the first one is around the culture, right? Actually, no, the first one is the vision, right? Uh -huh. So we've got to have a clear idea about, you know, where this business is going, why that matters to the leader, but also why it happens to the people that we're dealing with, our, our employees and our clients, and, you know, have some idea about what the future success is going to look like, because then that allows us to talk very, in a visionary way, 
to prospective clients, and that can be a magnet that can attract people into the business. So I think the vision's important. The meetings that are conducted within the business are important. So I think one advantage that uh, boutique businesses can have that bigger businesses don't is there's less BS meetings. Mm -hmm. You also, at the same time, though, have more access to the person who's in charge, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a smaller business. And mm -hmm. that is something that you can provide as a, an attraction tool and also as a retention tool to be able to say that you've got direct support from somebody who is the owner of the business. And I really strongly recommend one-on-one -on -one meetings as one way to build that relationship and to uh, help people be better and to make sure that everything that's important to the leader and the, the way that things are seen by the leader are reflected inside the organization with the people. So yeah, we've got vision, we've got meetings, and then the last one is culture, right? Mm -hmm. And culture, I think, in a smaller business is more important than it is in a bigger business. So a lot of my clients, if I ask them about culture, one of the things they'll tell me is, well, we've got a no dickhead policy, right? Yep. And no big business can tell me they've got that because a lot of dickheads will slip through the cracks in a big business. But in a smaller business, there's nowhere to hide if you, if you are a dickhead. And there's also nowhere to hide if you're an underperformer, right? So right. if the right. owner has high standards, then you know, they can create a, an organization which is a high performance culture, which will be an attractor to some people who don't want to be you know, around plotters or around hangers on. And I think inside bigger businesses, obviously there are some great leaders and bigger business was, businesses often have the advantage of being able to attract more of the best people because they are the biggest businesses. Mm -hmm. But there are also um, a lot of hangers on and because they're just so large, right? It's, it, 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 the business doesn't have the ability to be able to I guess, control all 100,000 employees, whereas a boutique business of 20 people, there's nowhere to hide if you, if you, if you are one of those things that I mentioned before. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are some practical tactics that a, a, a leader can use to improve culture? So be clear about your values, right? So what's important to you and then talk about that constantly. Uh -huh. So just when you are sick of hearing it in your own voice will be when other people start to notice that you're saying it. So you've got to be just keep hammering at home, hammering at home, hammering at home. So talking a lot about your values, being willing to call out people who are behaving in a way which isn't consistent with the values, particularly if we're clear on our values and we've had a conversation with prospective employees before they join about this is what our values are. You know, while we don't want to, I don't know what we have to say, you know, you must agree with all my values. We want to know that people can adhere to those values or hopefully there is some, I guess, resonance with the values that you have. And also when people are doing the right thing, we want to call out that great behavior and reward and recognize people who are acting in a way which is consistent with our values. So mm -hmm. I think there probably, you know, there are a few ways to build culture, I think, you know, if we're building performance-based cultures as well, then there's certain things that we can do in terms of you know, compensation and benefits and performance reviews. The one-on-one -on -one meetings are really important because mm -hmm. we, we can talk about the way that we would approach things and that is partly a values-based conversation because it's based on principles rather than you know, on specific scenarios. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a few ways to, to build culture. Yeah, that's great. That's, that, that's amazing. 